Good evening. In a socially distanced world, Design United is an optimistic digital platform for collaborative design and connection. Design United is an optimistic digital platform for collaborative design and connection. Design United was created in March 2020 during a period of intense lockdown and quarantine measures within the region. The aim behind Design United was to create an optimistic space for regional dialogue, connections, collaborations, and opportunities for young regional designers and design practices. A much needed network of support and peer mentorship during these uncertain times. Talented young designers and design studios working on design innovation with an approach that is relevant to our South Asian region have been invited to be a part of the platform. We also encourage design students The aim behind Design United is to create an optimistic space for regional dialogue, connections, collaborations, and opportunities for young designers and design practices, a much needed network of support and mentorship during these uncertain times. Welcome to Design United's 33rd Design Conversation a unique conversation with two designers from India. We're joined by textile designer Yadvi Agarwal and from Sri Lanka, we're joined by multidisciplinary visual designer and communicator Tilana Pereira. Due to unforeseen circumstances, graphic designer Shweta Malotra is unable to join this conversation today. Our apologies to the audience. We hope to have Shweta join us in our future design conversations coming up next year. I'm Varuna Shashidhar, founder principal of a regional landscape practice VSLA based in Bengaluru. I'm supported by my wonderful Design United and VSLA team in this endeavor, along with Clayworks Spaces. Clayworks creates flexible co-work spaces that focus on productivity and sustainability. They also offer a complete work from home solution. Design Conversations and Design United has featured talented emerging designers from our region, India, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, selected for their innovative approaches and also practices that have a deep resonance with the place they are from. Design United firmly believes in an interdisciplinary conversation and discussion. We believe that this leads to cross-pollination of ideas across various design disciplines and therefore collaborations. We've also had brilliant mentors, regional designers with great expertise and commitment to mentoring younger generation of designers. Our conversation next year will begin with two inspirational regional designers, architect Sanjay Mohi from Mindspace India, and architect Tanuj Goenka, director at Kerry Hill Architects, joining us for our very first design conversation next year on 9th January. So please continue to join us every Saturday for these conversations. With this background to Design United, let's move to the much anticipated presentation and conversation this evening. It's indeed a delight to welcome visual communication designer Thilini Pereira from Sri Lanka and fashion designer Yadvi Agarwal from India. Thilini Pereira, who joins us from Colombo, 
is a multidisciplinary visual communicator. She is currently the communications and design manager for the Jeffrey Bava Trust in Sri Lanka. For over a decade, she has contributed to advertising, publishing, and education, both in Sri Lanka and Vietnam. For the past five years, she has consulted for local and international rights-based organizations, focusing on activism, policymaking, community development, and gender and identity. Welcome, Tilini. We're also delighted to welcome Yadvi Agarwal, who is a textile designer who graduated from NID. She is the founder of Studio Yavi, based in New Delhi, India. Yavi is a fashion and accessories label that finds inspiration in the ethereal rather than the evident. Yavi presents their work through the art of indigenous textile making imbued with a story. The label consciously uses traditional handcrafting and hand painting techniques, evolving them to create an aesthetic of worn impressionism. At Yavi, each creation is a product of a long painstaking process, nurtured by several skilled craftsmen at every stage to create a conscious, sophisticated product for everyday understated luxury. Welcome Yadvi and Tilini to Design Conversation. We invite Tilini to share her presentation. Thank you. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, I would like to start by thanking Varna and the team at Design United for inviting me to be a part of this conversation panel, to Clearworks for providing us with the platform and to Anashwara and Disha for taking the time to moderate this conversation. My name is Tilini Pereira. Uh, I'm based in Colombo, Sri Lanka, and I'm a multidisciplinary visual communicator. For over a decade, I have contributed in a professional capacity to advertising, publishing, education industries in Sri Lanka and Vietnam. In Vietnam, I headed the design team for the branding and communications department at the Ho Chi Minh City campus of the Australian RMIT University for two years. After I returned to Sri Lanka, the past five years, I have been consulting for local and international rights-based organizations focusing on activism, policymaking, community development, and gender and identity. My work often intersects feminist and queer politics and has a through line of my deep interest in the arts. Currently, I'm managing communications and design for the Jeffrey Bava Trust. In this presentation today, you'll see the programming I'm a part of and the overall design I have produced. Um, in case there are non-architects or anyone who needs a quick introduction to Jeffrey Bava, Bava is a Sri Lankan architect and is now regarded as having been one of the most influential Asian architects of the 20th century. He came to architecture late, only qualifying at the age of 38 in 1957. But soon he established himself as Sri Lanka's most prolific and inventive architect establishing a collection of models of buildings in a post-independence context. This includes hotels, houses, schools, and state universities, also factories, offices, and numerous public buildings. And then sometime in 1982, the Jeffrey Bava Trust was established as a non-profit public trust with the objectives of furthering the fields of architecture, the fine arts, and environmental studies. Later in 93, the Lunuganga Trust, Trust was set up with the objective of managing and preserving the estate of Jeffrey Bawa. So we were a team of four brought together by the Trust to curate and run this year long program. The Centennial was an important marker for the Jeffrey Bawa and Lunuganga Trust to reflect on the significant achievements over the last 25 years as an occasion to promote the two trusts mission. 
This was designed around both broadening and deepening the trust engagement with his legacy. In July 2019, last year, the Bao 100 program was launched. The program reached a wide audience of students, architects, artists, academics, as well as the general public who joined us from many edges of the island and sometimes beyond. So for centuries, graphic design and architecture have coexisted in built environment. Although each discipline speaks in its own unique language, each has historically attempted a dialogue with the other. Architecture speaks of form, space and purpose, celebrating human continuity and offering experiences that are both function and inspire. And in graphic design or visual communication, there's typography, image and symbol, communicating the subtleties of time and place, which tells cultural and visual stories. In 1998, while working on a project, Bava suffered a massive stroke that left him paralyzed and after a long illness, he died in 2003. And looking at this timeline, it's safe to say that Bava missed the era of the digital. This is when the internet boomed. Suddenly, we all had cameras in our We were witnessing countless social media platforms being developed. And with all this happening at a very fast pace, online merging with our offline lives was the new norm. With the Bauer 100 program, the aim was to change and expand the accessibility to Bauer's work. The challenge with architecture is that it's a tangible and very much an offline experience. With his work, we're looking at textures, landscapes, light and shadow, all the details that you need to see in person. And through his works, there were other underlying themes to explore, like his collaborations, the politics of a site, accessibility materials in a post-colonial context, and so on. This was a recognition and celebration of multiple entities that made power. So the question for me was, how do we carry the genius and the histories of Bawa's work through to a new dimension the online space. And this is clearly expressed in one of our oral histories podcast episodes by Dominic Sansoni, who is a longtime friend and photographer who documented Bawa's work over a few decades. When asked during the conversation what he would have liked to ask or show Bawa now, he replied with this. But I'd love to share with Jeffrey today is what you can do on Photoshop which may sound ridiculous. In fact, one of the first times I saw Photoshop was when we were thinking of doing Lunuganga, the book, and how to put it together. I remember there was an office near Regal Cinema and we took Jeffrey there. Tilak ran that office. And none of us really knew what we were looking at. Tilak was showing things like, guess what? You can change the font. Would you like Times or Helvetica? or Ariel, or Times New Roman, or Helvetica. And here we could see it. I think Jeffrey would have been fascinated by the new phones, new cameras we use. When I took over the communications and design for Jeffrey Bava Trust, we only had an official website and a Facebook and Instagram accounts as official channels that shared images and announcements. And now, I have managed to expand the digital portfolio by understanding the type of media based on offline programming. And this is not just wanting to be on every social media platform out there. Each platform served a new way of sharing information with the digital audience and sometimes offline audience as well. From the memorial lecture videos to audio discussions and monthly newsletters that help to stay in touch. There's also an online design store to purchase prints and other merchandise. Everything that was planned as a physical event, we managed to make sure there's a doorway to the digital. And 
my work started from a slightly terrifying and exciting task of creating an identity and a style guide for the entire program. Exciting because it was a privilege to create an identity to celebrate his birth centenary. The terrifying factor was that this was for a person who is considered the epitome of style and structure. What kind of typeface would Bava be? Would he be a serif or a sans serif? Could he be a slab or even script? Most of my style related research questions were easily answered by observing his works. From creating a palette from the program campaign through the colors Bava used in his works and colors in the environment that framed his work. He was known to have used materials such as Robin blue ink, which is a dye to create the shocking bright blue found in some corners of his residence and the beautiful yellow ochre made by mixing a type of local clay with lime. There were times I felt like a digital color palette couldn't be that ever. With all these low tech innovations, I wanted his incredible work to frame the centenary identity with environmental textures, landscapes and symbols. From there, it was also an understanding of the overall media in conjunction with the curated program. When we looked at the program, how much of it was dependent on physical events. The green highlights are exhibitions that took place in Lunuganga as well as Colombo. The dark red is for Baba Architectural Awards launch and also a launch of the renovated Deserum house that took place on the same day. The gold tabs are for talks and panels we had, including the Oral Histories Project, which is now a podcast. The beige are two private events as the rest of the program was open to the public. The blue are online ventures only. Once. Under these circumstances, sorry, if you look at the timeline that starts from July 2019, the first five events took place in July itself, which uh, is on Baba's birth month. And the rest followed until January 2020, um, when January 2020, when COVID-19 pandemic started unfolding. And by March 2020, Sri Lanka went into an island-wide lockdown. All these events were meant to follow through up to July 2020 to complete the centenary program. Under these circumstances, I was able to adjust the communication strategy to fit the situation, rethinking access to the program when physical attendance became impossible. Two online exhibitions were produced based on the unground exhibitions that had been produced last year, which was 2019 and social media platforms are used to engage with followers through various measures. What I'm gonna do now is I will take you through some of the main programming of Bar 100 and explain how it served the online agenda and expanded the reach and understanding of his work. This was the first of the series to introduce some of the extraordinary holdings in Bava's collection and was in situ at Lunuganga. The objects provided a first glimpse of both social and private uses of beautiful things collected over a lifetime by Bawa. The campaign design was supposed to, was supported by beautiful image we commissioned photographer Luca Alagiavana to produce as a way of archiving, but also for the means of publicity. For the in-situ exhibition to project a sense of architectural drawings, the wayfinding materials and signage was printed on vellum and hung from the ceiling. The exhibition took place in July 2019 and sometime during our 10th week of our COVID lockdown this year, we published the exhibition online. This also helped us to explore the ways that we can present in-situ exhibitions that need to be viewed with all your senses onto a 2D platform, highlighting underlying qualities that you would have missed if you were there in, in person. Following this, we had Kinga Kumar on Bawat Centenary birth anniversary. Um, this renowned Japanese architect delivered the 16th annual memorial lecture. 
the video recording and the audio is now available on our website and our social media platforms. Kinga Kumar's contribution to the program doesn't end here. He goes on to being one of our five artists, part of the gift installation series at Yunuganga. More on that later. This exhibition of photography by Sebastian Posinges and the author of probably the most extensive collection of photographs by of Bava's work, taken over a course of five years, reveals Posinges extraordinary sensitivity to the poetry of his buildings. The photographs were installed at Bava's former office, which is now the Gallery Cafe. This was also one of the exhibitions we published online this year during the lockdown and can be viewed through Jeffrey Bauer website. The GIFT project, which is one of our biggest projects, uh, was coming together later on in the year. And the launch was planned um, for September. The panel discussion with the participating artists helped to give insight into artist concepts, themes that they were exploring. A conversation that we published on SoundCloud and one that we encourage audiences to listen to before visiting the Lunuganga Gardens to view the physical installations. This helped with two aspects for us to minimize our print to paper footprint and giving access to the artist via an audio channel for those who otherwise may not be able to. Sometime in September, we had the Greedy Forest exhibition. This exhibition was about the landscape environments of Lucky Sena Naika. Through extensive research carried out by curator Max Moya, it presented an incisive and profound understanding of Lucky's work. This is also a celebration of friendship and collaborations. Ina De Silva and Lucky Sena Naika play a big role in Bava's work. Their work can be found as part of the artistic landscape within Bawa's work. And if you've been to Kandalama Hotel, you would remember Lucky's sculpture of a huge open wing owl on top of the main staircase hall. In 1962, Ina De Silva and her husband commissioned Jeffrey Bawa to design their home in the heart of Colombo. Decades later, in 2009, when Ina wished to sell the land the house is built on, the Lunuganga Trust worked with a team of architects, archaeologists, and engineers to carefully disassemble the house and rebuild it stone by stone at Lunuganga, which is now called number five at Lunuganga. It is with this exhibition the Trust opened the house to the public for the first time. And if you've been to the Benthur Beach Hotel, at the reception you will find an incredible batik ceiling created by Ina and her workshop. This is a picture of a small sample of that ceiling. This was also a collaboration for us, the Bar 100 team, as Max Moya, who had curated the exhibition in Colombo the previous year, worked with us to set, up, set this up all the way in Lunuganga. And other programming such as children's art workshops were conducted by our friends at the Let's Build Great Things Collective where their focus is to teach art through an architectural lens. They designed a series of art workshops inspired by Lucky Sena Naika's Owls and how to build mini tree houses with found objects around the garden for the neighborhood kids. The gift was a series of installations at Lunuganga where the garden is explored as a site of hospitality and a place of encounter. Themes of nature, shelter, labor, journey, generosity, perception, and reflection will offer each artist a unique opportunity to respond to the work of Bava and his garden. The artists invited for this project are or was artists Kinga Kumar, Dominic Sansoni, Lee Mingwei, Dainita Singh, and Chandragupta Tenura. All five have had a long in interest and history in the work of Bawa.
this is this um, sorry for this work at Lunuganga, Kinga Kumar drew inspiration from the outdoor furniture Bava design for Kandalama, a few of which you can see around the garden. Working with a local weaver and a metalsmith, the pavilion was designed to offer a brief moment of reflection through the framing of views. Through these installations, we wanted to document the process in film and produce trailers and a full film for each of the artists, which we will be publishing soon. We commissioned local videographer Kavindu Sivaraja, who managed to create what we consider a perfect 30 second trailer encapsulating King Kumar's vision. Let me play this trailer for you. I was so inspired and, and also very impressed with, uh, by that harmony between the environment and the building. And we got many hints from Japanese tea house to create that intimate space in this environment. It is intimate space, but it is open to environment. It is totally as a, a combined. Understanding the best way to present something is part of communications and design. How would this best be seen or felt? The press articles and the writings on it may not be able to provide the details one would need to see and understand the process of each artist. Documenting this gift as a moving image where you get to see what the artists have created and publish it online for wider access and to demonstrate that galleries could be anywhere you want it to be. Next, Dominic Sansoni has been photographing Lunugang since 1977. For his work in the GIF, Dominic took a very close look at the garden, following the garden at a scale that is rarely observed. This garden within a larger garden, which Dominic has photographed, reflects many of the themes that are characterized, has characterized his practice over the years. An interest in chroma or the qualities of color landscapes and things observed as they are naturally found to be. This work titled Zephyrus Breath by Li Mingwei reveals the sensitivity to a place and encounter which characterizes much of Mingwei's work, offering an experience that is unique to each visitor. His installation works as a soundscape created by a large group of brass wind chimes. This installation reflects on how Bava himself used different bells, 14 different bells throughout Lunuganga, each bell having a distinct register which helped identify his location in the garden. Tainita Singh's work follows an extensive body of work on Bava. She has documented Bava's work under various themes and for the gift, her installation featured a structure of portraits of chairs in Lunuganga. In this new work, Tenura engages with the garden through the existing natural man-made elements and Bhava's own practice of using systems of grids and axes to ground his work, which then negotiates the extent of natural landscape. There are seven sets of the stoneware brick artworks placed around the garden. The next project, Oral Histories, is our very own podcast series. Jeffrey Bauer was famously silent about his work. There are only a handful of records where he opened up about his influences, routines, and practice. He also rarely saved up material like correspondence or sketches, which often form the core parts of an archive. With this project, we try to fill this void by collecting the memories, stories, and experiences of Bauer's friends, clients, and colleagues an ongoing endeavor and so far we have 10 episodes and we plan to keep adding more. This podcast is available on SoundCloud and our Apple podcast channel. And by this time we were back in July and ready for the annual memorial lecture for 2020. Still very much amidst an ongoing pandemic, we had Bangladeshi architect Marina Tabasan joining us virtually to deliver the lecture, which was also a new format for us. Usually this would be an in-person lecture with an audience of over 
a thousand joining us. So this time we partnered with a local TV station to record the lecture virtually and was broadcast island wide on Bava's 101st birthday anniversary, reaching a national audience far and wide. So those are some of the main highlights from the Bava 100 program. Not only is that not only is very much an offline program, but documenting it different mediums so that it is accessible beyond a period of time. Like the possibility of celebrating an architect's work through a national stand, a medium usually reserved for national celebrations and sometimes only portray a certain kind of achievement. Why shouldn't we question the way society views architectural structures and consider them to be a great national interest to change what we think a national treasure is. And what are the ways you can celebrate architecture and tangible structures that doesn't involve just looking at buildings. These structures carry history and always a history of people and collaborations, a through line that's evident in all of Bawa's work. It requires us to look at look beyond the analytics and data because how do you measure how something made you feel or measure the insight and knowledge you received by engaging with art? To think beyond the publications, what publications are, that the information doesn't only end up on beautifully copyable books, but formats that are more reachable. And my work often involves around finding ways to engage, to finding ways to change this. It's not only the publicity campaigns we get to design, but the story we weave and present to the public. That it sometimes never is about one person and their incredible talent, but the nuances of his work of the time and place he was part of. And the language we use to publicize and share our knowledge, changing and questioning who gets to engage and interact with his work is, what the demo, is where the democratizing starts. And I will leave you with this, the team's taking, Jeffrey, the team's taking Bava's legacy forward. On your left, you will see the trustees of the Jeffrey Bava and the Lunuganga Trust. And on the right is the Bava 100 team. Our curator, Shari De Silva, head of program, Shanika Pereira, and the head of production, Chris Silva and myself. This itself is an intergenerational collaboration, something Baba would have appreciated. With that, I will end my presentation. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thelini, for sharing your fascinating work with the Baba Foundation. Indeed, a daunting challenge to create a visual communication palette for a much admired master of Asian architecture, also amidst the pandemic, but you have done it so successfully through your thoughtful work and your thorough presentation. Thank you so much for taking us through this journey through Baba's work. Thank you. I would now like to request Yadvi to kindly share her work. Thanks. Hi, um, am I audible? Yes. And do you have my screen? Yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Hi guys. Uh, so I'm really uh, excited to be here today, uh, you know, invited by Varna and I'm really grateful for this opportunity, uh, you know, to sort of speak about, uh, you know, what I do and what my art form is and it is I mean different from architecture but I feel there is a space where you know everything sort of comes together when you're talking about you know the basics of a design process and um, you know how they do influence each other uh, sort of all squares so um, thank you for inviting me 
and um, yeah so mine is sort of more like a personal journey since um, you know uh, yavi is a brand in fashion and textiles that uh, i launched about roughly three and a half years ago and you know there have been influences i think from various different parts of my life that have led uh, to you know i mean it's basically i can join the dots when i look backwards now and thank you for this you know because i would have never sort of uh, gone back and looked at the journey and you know put things together and also yeah so uh, i'm yadvi agarwal and i uh, belong to delhi and uh, you know i would like to begin with you know some of my childhood experiences you know which sort of uh, did uh they were sort of small experiences but um they somewhere they had an uh you know belief inducing impact on me that you know said that okay fine maybe design is something that you are meant for right so first experience would be you know i was in i think fifth grade or something and our uh, there was an supw that we had in school and mine was batik and you know we used to do some dye and dye and all of that and i remember one day we were making some artworks and you know there was this old box of crayons uh, that i had and you know we were all hustling around our faculty and you know he's like okay you know i need a particular color but i don't know which one it is you know which one of you is going to pull it out and uh, you know i pulled out a certain crayon and he said you know that is absolutely um, it was an olive dirty olive color i remember even now but you know that and he said yes i mean he looked at me and he said wow this is absolutely brilliant i mean somewhere that has an impact i did have an impact on me at that early age and i said okay fine you know great you like what i do um then of course you know uh, i think i have a lot of influence from my own family and from my mother you know so um like she would take me to delhi hat with her you know while you know for while shopping for say some dairies and all for the house and you know while i you know she would again we would change the curtains or the color scheme of our rooms you know at least once a year or something so you know she would always make me a part of the process she would take me with her and be like okay which one do you want for your room or what do you like you know what's the color scheme and all so uh, you know i think becoming a part of that little bit of design process of the space around myself um also like really i mean i found it really engaging and interesting so i think those are some early uh, memories that i have that i think were you know that left some certain type of uh, impact on my brain uh, then of course i mean i i i was a science student and um and then i decided i actually sat for architecture as well as uh, fashion and textile entrances and architecture is actually something that i would have loved to do equally uh however the path that i chose was i did my undergrad in fashion design from pearl academy of fashion new delhi and then i pursued my masters from nid in textile design to further my knowledge uh into you know what really goes on to into the making of the fabric and not just you know about the silhouette since fashion is that although we do get to explore a lot of that so i'll briefly uh you know sort of tell you you know how that i mean it it was a four year undergrad and a three and a half year post grad first bit was in fashion and the second was in textile but i feel it really sort of uh, you know laid the foundation of uh, what my design ideology is uh, and that is what i follow in my brand so um, you know during fashion of course i did i was uh, i did realize that you know uh i was strong in surface design but i think one of the best things that happened during my undergrad was that you know i ended up participating in a lot of competitions design competitions and uh that sort of um you know yeah and some of them like there was this one it was a lingerie design competition back in 2010 it took me to london to represent india since i had won the uh, the nationals and you know the experience was so beautiful we had you know helena christensen who's a supermodel 
who was uh, modeling the garments. We had Victor and Rolf and, uh, you know, a lot of other uh, eminent jury members, you know, looking at the clothes. The whole experience was so eye-opening. You know, I met so many contestants, listened to their stories, and, you know, each and everything was so beautiful. So I think that is also uh, like a milestone that sort of did uh, instill some more belief in me and, you know, really sort of uh, kept me going. Uh, yeah. And uh, so after I did fashion, like I said, I realized I wanted to be able to, you know, weave and make unique things. So in order to weave and, you know, really understand knitting and textiles, you got to get into the yarns and, you know, what gets into construction and all of that instead of it just being about the cuts. So that's where I said, yes, I definitely want to, um, you know, further this uh, knowledge. And I was... Uh, you know, then I joined NID uh, for my master's. And, you know, over, uh, NID is based on the Bauhaus School of Thought. And it basically uh, focuses on refinement, you know. And uh, I think it was a it was a wonderful experience. Um, and the first thing you sort of taught there is to unlearn whatever you know about design and then start from the beginning. So it was um you know so it was unlearning and then you know we had it was multidisciplinary and you know we would interact with say even automobile designers product designers animators and we guys were in textiles so it was really interesting we learned from each other and you know uh it, it just basically became like a more holistic approach where design as a whole came together and it was not just you know say about fashion or about textiles and over here i did already have a you know a very stemmed sort of a love and fascination with the crafts and the textiles of the country because i was exposed to that from early childhood but however it became more shaped and more uh, my knowledge became more in depth during the masters and you know these are some of the things which sort of led to uh, you know founding of the of my design ideology then um, I'd like to take you through my one of my internship projects with Pero, uh, which is a label, a uh, fashion label. Now it's about 10 years old uh, by Anit Aroda. And it's really, really done well and it's gone places. And I had the opportunity to work with them in an early phase, uh, I think the third year. And this was, I think, 2013, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. So, uh, and the whole experience was very enriching. And I want to sort of, you know, here when I'm talking about this, I want to talk about the design process that we followed and how all of these experiences, whether at, in my colleges or, you know, at these phases where I interned or did my diploma project or other experiences sort of, you know, uh, shaped into the processes that I follow while we design at uh, Yavi. So, you know, it was uh, the project was to study the art of beadwork and identify artisans and develop surfaces beaded or like beaded for a portly bag and a detachable collar, taking inspiration from English provincial prints. So the first phase of any sort of a project is, of course, research, you know, so there was a lot of, you know, books and all uh, that I went through, you know, it was really interesting reading through how, you know, uh, beading is done. And um, it was very interesting and then there were some um some sort of samples of things you know uh, that i had and you know sort of studying the tactility because i feel in textiles uh, honestly how a thing looks and how a thing feels is so important and uh, you know it is it's it's really in the details then uh, I think there was the phase next step was to sort of brainstorm, you know, sort of uh, opening up of your mind and, you know, like, how do you take uh, certain inspiration and how many ways in which you can sort of approach it, you know, so say met different methods of beading, uh, you know, stitching, weaving, and then there were keywords that are put together, you know, it could be a cut work, it could be a lattice, it could be some sort of relief or plain things. And then there are some images here, which are, you know, market research, I did a lot of um, research in terms of what beads exist in the market, you know, in Chani Chalk and in Sadar Bazaar, you know, all the metallic old vintage frames, and all of that. And you know, I did come up with ideas, you know, beyond the brief, say, you know, what other products could be and, you know, what 
what could look like bead work say like a french knot you know uh, you know tapestry pin needle stitch cross stitch so and then then i of course studied you know other types of beads and um, so these these were and then the next step was of course to put together a color palette i did find a place where you know i find i found all the beads that i wanted and uh, we worked with very small sizes of beads since we wanted very fine work and the first uh, experiment over here see i had to identify artisans as well so um, i identified somebody in sikandrabad a little of uh, you know on the outskirts of delhi and we the first caller you see up here is that and i feel that you know the the sort of finesse and finish over here it's fine as a step one but we really quite were not there uh this is the one on the top right i'm talking about and then you know then uh this was the one on the bottom right was you know made with french knots very fine french knots as you can see and you know then this was i think a finer version of the same thing so you know when i talk about process of refinement and design this is what i mean so and of course you know how many ways in which you can really fill a collar you know with beads uh another technique that we did was the cross needle uh, technique where each and every i mean your each pixel is what is sort of put together and stitched onto it and uh, of course there was a lot of graphs that were made uh, to sort of get here and these are some of the final products you know these bags and all we used for on the ramps for the show and the collars were a part of the collection second bit of this uh, project was you know uh, working with an artisan which uh, she her name is uh, sita ben and she is from amdabad and um, it was honestly extremely enriching to be working and staying with an artisan and uh, you know the sort of things that exist she is from um, um i don't exactly remember which part of saurashtra from gujarat and you know the bead work is really big there so you know i saw what she does understood her processes etc then you know i'd gone through a lot of those books and i said okay let's try and do develop some beading techniques also let's try and do something different so um here what i see of course one can patch the beads onto a fabric that is what we did in the earlier part with embroideries here we wanted to make a collar or something without a base surface so there that's where you know the whole beading comes into play so you know we made graphs and we sort of uh, i mean i made graphs and we did all these uh, you know try to bead it together and you know step wise as you can see how uh, we finally achieved the floral motif here and at the bottom you can see you know how the lattice is taken into consideration and how that is uh, sort of leading to development of this design yeah so this is i mean this is how uh, i how i mean we follow a design process or i followed it here and yeah then the next project i can briefly take you through is my diploma project that i did with eka which is also a fashion label very well known currently and there also i had an opportunity to work on with the earlier you know years in the earlier years of the brand and you know with the collection that we put together you know uh, uh, the designer reena singh had uh, debuted at uh, wilf uh, fashion week so you know i was really happy about it of course to be a part of the project so here of course you know there was a brief you know i had to um, develop a collection of textiles to be used for a range of 25 garments for spring summer 15 women's wear incorporating of certain design elements which define the uh, dna of the brand so again you know this is where again i'm focusing on the design process so you know how uh, how things sort of went ahead was first the project brief then the second was really understanding the dna of the brand you know the company profile philosophy the clients the contemporaries you know to even study what the competition is then there was research in terms of study of the forecast and uh, then brainstorming you know arriving at a general mood and direction for the season uh using several inspirations to loosely define the overall mood then i came up with a proper mood board uh for the entire season which would include woven's prints as well as embroideries and then arriving at a tentative color palette and then we uh went into you know each of the parts uh, one by one uh first was woven's and you know 
then there was a brief, then you look at what resources you have, market study, then the collection of ovens, how I sort of divided it into uh, certain further elements of design when it comes to ovens. And uh, yeah, you know, I can sort of now, this is this is how, this is what the timeline looks like, um, but I can start taking you uh, through the actual uh, process here. So this is just one of the boards uh, from WGSN on the top left uh, that I picked out here. So WGSN has all these reports uh, predicting, you know, what is going to be in. Uh, and normally fashion works a year in advance of design because you're designing for a international market. And, you know, by the time you design, you showcase, you book orders, it's time for deliveries. So, yeah. So, of course, like I said, the first step was the interpretation of the forecast. Below over here, you see is the mood board, you know, where, uh, you know, uh, the images sort of are put together. These were given to me by the client. That's my sponsor. And, uh, you know, for the mood and feel and, you know, things like that. So the keywords then that came from here were carefree, relax, you know, countryside, poetic, filter, tonal. And with that, we moved ahead, you know, and we moved on to a color palette. Now, of course, working first with Pantones and then working with, uh, you know, dyed fabrics, watches, seeing really what works, what does not work. Then when we come to the first part of wovens, these were all woven uh, in uh, either in linens, which were yarn dyed, or they were uh, woven uh, in uh, cotton khadi in West Bengal. So the first bit was, you know, really about border designs or all over designs. And, you know, I thought of, you know, what all could be the iterations. There were a lot of things. And just below here is a, what a spec sheet looks like for you to see like a final one. And yeah, uh, so that was that. And then this is the second bit where, you know, I was, uh, uh, interpreting my version of filtered florals. Filtered florals was one of the uh, uh, WGSN forecast reports that really sort of uh, inspired me to do things. So, you know, I went about creating my own filters, you know, with either with papers or with here, you can see I'm resisting and uh, uh, over here I can, I'm doing resist printing, block printing with, uh, you know, cello tape and then you sort of take it away and, all and these were again, you know, for painterly effect, you know, what, how can I sort of take the pigment to dye uh, onto how much do I take? What is the consistency of the pigment? Those were the things that I then played around with. And finally, a uh, surface that we used a lot or a technique that we used a lot was this discharge printing. So where, you know, your discharge um, chemical is also a part of one of the blocks, which you see over here, which is a white uh, discharge and then it's put through certain uh, you know uh, uh, you know heat certain amount of heat and then the color sort of discharges and it also gives a really beautiful very uh, romantic very summery sort of a feel and that was the whole uh, you know um, that's the whole DNA of the brand that's what their clientele wants that's what they sell here at the bottom is something you know again doing uh, making all these placement prints and all. Then uh, comes the part with the uh, for the embroideries here, particularly you know this uh, image over here of the flower. You know it sort of defined the tonality in terms of say you know white on white or tonals. Uh, you know playing with colors um, and all. Then the next stage was to do a little bit of nature study to really get the you know, feel of it, you know, what it is. There are big leaves, there are small leaves, the textures, etc. and all. Then um, I went on to, you know, getting different materials and studying different stitches. And, you know, if you can see over here, like, you know, all of these clusters, they've been put together with various different materials, as well as the sizes of the, uh, you know, suppose if there's an anchor thread, it's got a six, it's a six ply thread. If I use a two ply versus a six ply, you know, it's going to give me certain difference in volume and therefore there will be depth. So I think this is where I really explored very, um, what do you call it, um, very minute details and uh, sort of made these interesting, uh, very fine embroideries. And over here, you can see how it was finely used, some bit of it. And this is what the collection was the, of the wovens and uh, 
you know, uh, trends, that trend this is uh, when it was debuted. So I think really from these two experiences, I took a lot out and, you know, this I learned a lot. The two brands were very different. One was, you know, mostly focused on surfacing, on very heavy uh, embroideries, working with, um, you know, craftsmen and all of that. And of course, here also we're working with craftsmen. But this was more of, a, you know, subtle, very everyday uh, sort of a look and feel of the brand. So I think, you know, overall, the whole understanding for me at this point of time was quite quite a nice mixed bag of things. And then uh, after this, I worked at a corporate for a small period of time in Bombay. And while it was really interesting, um, you know, uh, it's a huge place. I mean, I've never really, I'd never worked in a corporate before. And uh, it's really mesmerizing to see so many people and so many departments you know, sort of working together. It's absolutely another scale. Um, however, I realized, you know, over there that somewhere, you know, the, in the design process, um, the amount of refinement that is possible gets highly limited um, by the infrastructure or by the sort of uh, procedures, you know, that are followed to be uh, that are to be followed in a well, uh, in a in a corporate. So yeah and you know that's where i really started thinking you know when i was in bombay and i said you know what am i doing am i really is really is it really my thing and then i realized that it's not my cup of tea and then i thought okay do i want to get more experience or do i want to start, do something on my own and something sort of really pushed me to say you know, okay fine let's just try it what's the big deal about it so at that time, you know, this is back in 2015, you know, and, um, you know, I started uh, conceptualizing the brand. And, uh, you know, uh, I thought what, about, you know, I thought about what it would do, or who it's going to serve to, what would be my value sets, um, you know, then, of course, working, uh, you know, on a name, you know, I, I had a list of a lot of, uh, you know, words, first of all, I found that, okay, that I want it to resonate with uh, uh, you know what I feel or what I needed to express you know basically there was a very strong need to be able to express myself through you know through what I feel what I dream through my work and uh, yeah so this conceptualization I think slowly but surely took about eight months you know for me to actually come up with a name and finalize that and, uh, you know, the final name was Yavi and I loved it because of the meaning. And also, I mean, it's sort of, um, you know, it's, it's, of course, it's my name. Also, a lot of designers use their name, but I didn't want to do that. I really wanted the brand to have its own identity. And I do hope that even when I'm not there, you know, it sort of goes ahead. Um, yeah. And, you know, Yavi meant the conjo conjoining of the heavens with the earth. And I said, you know, that's the brain space, you know, and voila, this is it. So, uh, yeah, you know, that's the journey of how I really, you know, that was the birth of Yavi. And uh, this is how, you know, finally I sort of narrowed down on a name. You know, I haven't included all those pages, you know, where I brainstormed a lot of uh you know, names, etc. But yeah, that was quite a thorough process. And uh, yeah, then I, you know, said about, you know, what is going to be my story? What? So I think everything that defines what I do at Yavi or what my ideology is, has come through all these experiences of my life. You know, whether it is the internship, whether it is the, you know, working uh, with Eka or whether it is my uh, design education. I think all of those sort of come together and, you know, amalgamate into the brand or into the philosophies. So like, uh, so the philosophy is to make mindful designs for a conscious consumer. And each of the products have a personality of their own with a unique story. And I love to work with the indigenous uh, traditional textiles because I feel, you know, our country is so rich, so rich, yet so underappreciated. And it's really important to put us on a global, uh, you know, platform and really talk about our stories. I mean, the amount of work that goes into an ikat, you know, resist dying and leaving, it's absolutely phenomenal and it's gorgeous. 
and people need to know these stories and you know with passing times of course you know uh, you know a lot of we were families their kids are not wanting to take these crafts ahead which is actually a really uh, it's it's going to lead to extinction it's going to lead to extinction and that's something i really really don't want i really want to sort of uh, you know uh, give them some uh, give them a visibility right so yes definitely i think uh, i i love to work with crafts uh, and those sectors uh, while still working for a international clientele so it can't be extremely ethnic in the sense but it has to be contemporary so yeah and yeah so over here now you know i mean i am not a graphic designer however you know there were graphic designers around me during uh, nid and i did see what the process is like you know so you know i said okay fine let me try do on my own plus i also told a couple of my friends from different uh, you know streams even ui ux designers okay why don't you just do some logos and all so you know i came with some keywords and um, you know and then i asked them to explore i explored it on my own also and uh, you know finally this is the logo the one on the right top that i finalized i i wanted it to be small i wanted it to have a ring of course yavi already was very easy to catch also also a lot of people a lot of uh, europeans you know because they can't pronounce the the in my name they anyway used to call me yavi so i said okay why not that and it has a beautiful meaning right and so you know and i wanted it to be impactful so i you know replaced the dots with the uh, you know from black to red and i i mean eventually i was quite happy with uh, you know where we sort of reached with the logo yeah so um you know one more aspect you know while all this was happening another thing that was happening you know in my subconscious or in my brain was you know um i had visited uh, you know paris a couple of times and also during that uh, the launch day design competition back in 2010 and you know what i mean of course you know and i have sort of realized that the city has a personality of its own you know it's like it feels different you know you are going from one uh, subway station to the other you know the musicians they add so much character so much to your experience of you know that journey otherwise you would just be sort of sitting probably with your headphones put in but it is so beautiful uh, and yeah so you know i think the subway musicians really had a like the whole experience of it then what i noticed was you know how all these cafes all these there's a really small tiny crammed up chairs and you know tables outside you know and it it's somewhere it brings um intimacy to the experience the whole look and feel of it was very uh, capturing to me and you know whenever i would walk the streets i would be like wow you know this is something which is so i don't know uh, you know culturally there right and then uh, there was one day that i walked you know to muse orangerie and that's where i saw claude monet's work and i was absolutely mind blown as well over there and then you know and then there was one more experience i think i was i got out of a subway station la cite and you know sat and there were these um, musicians who were playing um and the passer by would just come drop their bags and engage in you know dancing and i was like wow like where 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 do you see a city where it's like i was almost like there's a huge orchestra music playing in the background and you know uh, yeah there's i mean it was magic to my eyes to my senses the whole personality you know of a city how a city could have its own personality which is so engaging so artistic and so you know in the arts also so it didn't have an influence uh, on my senses and you know this was building up in the background and uh, and i knew that i wanted to take this expression ahead coupled with the crafts right so when i speak about personality i i came back and i said you know i want to do i want to create what i feel uh using a traditional textile so the first thing that i created ever was um, you know suppose yeah we know that india is really rich in textiles right 
so the first thing i created was you know this uh, thing on a block printer's table um which which had a resonance with impressionism i think it's going to be coming in the following slides uh, the process um yeah and uh, this was actually the first collection i made and you know i really like working with small things uh, you know creating little, small artworks and things with different materials so uh, this collection was more about making textile jewelry so of course i painted that fabric on a block printer's table which uh, was just with a lot of layering and you know impressions basically i was taking impressions and creating like an artwork and all and then i cut them out into all these little little things and uh, you know shapes and put them together and um this was really like sort of fascinating to me and um, yeah so this was like uh, so i made like 26 textile jewelries and there were about 12 garments in the first collection that i ever made and there were some of these bags also with those textiles uh that i'm talking about you know there you can see like there's a lot of impressions there are a lot of uh, blocks overlapping and then i had some you know stitches and all also that come together you know and then i sort of put together a nice story you know um uh to add another element to it and yeah and then these were some of the jackets the hand painted jackets that i made out of those uh, the hand painted uh, fabrics and you know these were made over a period of time so you know they have like a sort of vintage feel to it the pigment is not so fresh and i think you know i mean uh, while i would say that what i've eventually come to do is a little maximalist i think if you look at the textiles in person you will see that there is a little bit of a vintage uh, feel to it you know it's not all that um, you know manisha dora <laughs> anyhow so uh, yeah and so you know with this with this collection i exhibited and i um, and the people who the the uh, i exhibited in paris in uh, at who's next and maison et obshe uh, and uh, the people who the discerning of the art fraternity is what really caught uh, the it this caught their attention so the victorian albert museum moma san francisco those guys became interested in the jewelries and the hand painted garments then you know curators of these exhibitions they were like wow this is uh, really um, interesting you know and very unique and of course no two pieces can pretty much be the same because you are painting it so you know it has that novelty about it so there were all these sculptors and all of these guys who picked it up you know so um of course you know monetary wise or volume wise it was not a success but yes it was promising at that time because you know it was the people who are talking about art who are the fashionistas of the 60s you know who are saying that yes we love it you know so that sort of uh, really really uh, gave me a boost at that time yeah uh, here is uh, you know that uh, the impressionist is now what i call it so see this is a hand painted jacket and you know when i'm printing on a block printer stable it's not like i'm playing only with the blocks i look for random materials you know found objects because that can give me more texture more freedom you know to paint or to create so yeah this is a short video of uh, you know showing how this particular texture is made
um yeah i would say you know yavi is where art meets fashion to create a new aesthetic in one impressionism and over a period of time this is how impressionism evolved for me uh you know you can see there's a lot more uh fabrics to it a lot more textures feels falls uh visual representations um you know and uh, of course i you know after this i think after this we started the instagram page as well and i think that's where i really started working with other visual artists and understanding that sphere as well so for example this image is a moving image you know the headgear is uh, it's sort of engaging so you know again you know how you're creating that art the design you know which is like like you know almost like the experiences in your own life right you're putting one layer after the other and creating that how do you create more dimensions to it is how i started thinking you know i mean that would be the next way right uh, how to visually communicate your designs and ideas and uh, i most of it is you know say per, on perception and uh, it's intangible right uh, when you're of course uh, talking about uh, uh, communicating over um are communicating the same thing offline online sorry yeah so um moving ahead yeah this was another collection that i made uh where you know i was playing in the shades between white translucent to blues uh, uh to deep blues and with a little bit of accents and so i will just tell you what uh you know and like here i would just like to take you through what are the basic textiles or stories so each of my collection i follow certain stories that i want to develop and sometimes it so happens that even though i'm working on a particular story or a craft or something i feel at the end of its journey the time is there to showcase but you know i'm not quite there with the design process so i normally do not put that in at that, on that season you know i further develop it only when i think that yes you know the refinement has come across and i'm happy with the result is when i finally sort of put it out so over here like you can see you know that's a jamdani dress so yes uh, bengal clusters is one of the first few clusters i work with and uh, this is a yarn uh, dyed linen stole with you know tassel details uh, over here also i mean it's not very clear but there is a lot of lot of hand details and all that go in like i said you i like uh, working on small minute details and things right uh this was another element that i decided to work with uh, for the textile jewelry for this season and i sort of put it together and in a different different ways you know tessellations arranging composition i feel design in the end of the day is a lot about composition colors composition and of course all the other materials that come along with it so this is where you know uh, that's that's where i was really also exploring textile jewelries it's really close to my heart and every season i try to put something new some new techniques and you know create with a new theme then uh, this is again a uh, uh, it's been woven in uh, bengal it's a fine uh, cotton khadi so of course the checks and uh, uh, stripes there were more fabrics as well borders and all that were designed for this then other than this during the season one of the uh, interesting uh, sectors that i work with or craftsmen that i work with there were this uh, there's this afghani refugee women cluster in delhi and you know they do beautiful hand crochet and if you look here you know this is a hand crochet that um, i've developed with them and this is made using very fine silk yarn so you know already silk yarn is a little delicate to handle but the final outcome is absolutely phenomenal and another level of artistry these guys are absolutely talented and you know so this is uh, yeah and even this top you see here this is also completely hand crocheted by these women so again you know another way of i mean art art and craft is art and craft you know it doesn't matter where they really belong to but it's gorgeous and it needs continuance it needs uh, people to be seeing it recognizing it showcasing it taking it ahead you know so that's where uh, this line of course this collection also had some hand painted jackets and other things and this was uh, this particular the one on the left top 
uh, that top it came out of one of my projects at nid and where you know i was using a soluble sheet of paper and i was trying to embroider on top of it uh, and create lattice sort of structures you know basically creating fabric fabric construction out of you know other materials so this was actually made using ribbons of course it had to have enough number of intersections to put um, technically to, so, so that it holds itself together so coming to that i feel you know working with crafts is one thing knowing your heritage and you know working to your strengths and cre creating innovations within that is good i also feel that you know uh, innovation is equally important so this was also this the surface on the left is something that i had actually developed in college so soluble sheets of paper uh, exist and people use it to embroider fabrics okay and it's mostly used to give a little bit of more strength you know and more um, yeah mostly more strength to the fabric people normally don't just embroider over that and you know create fabric out of it but here that's what i did i sort of embroidered a lot of different colors of threads over and over again so it became thick enough and there were enough intersections holding it together and then you know then i took and i dissolved it into into the water so the sheet went off and eventually the, a new fabric was constructed and then of course there is i've added a little bit of embellishment here and this also became a part of my collection you know as going ahead this is the second usp i would say first being the impressionist um you know the hand painted jackets and all and uh, yeah so this this i call it the one thread embroidery and of course over a period of time these jackets they are going to open up a little bit and it's almost like the the garment has a life along of its own you know it's also evolving and changing so yeah that is one more thing that uh, you know has become a part of uh, of the language of the brand and uh, upcycling and sustainability i think you know i think it's been it's in our dna you know as indians you know every piece of cloth has like some 10 lives you know my mother also sort of uh, you know keeps on recycling something becomes eventually a pocha or i don't know so there's so many things i think while growing up only we learn uh, so upcycling and sustainability something that should come to any indian pretty much naturally and other than that of course uh, you know it's it's so important with global warming with climate change and all that we need to be responsible in the end of the day we need to be mindful of our actions i mean uh, <clears throat> yeah we can't keep consuming without any uh, you know thought process so and you know i i genuinely i love all the fabrics that we work with they're all 100% pure fabrics and uh, i work with the craftsmen and we all those so they're very rich and when you sort of cut garments you know there's a substantial amount of waste and you know those were sort of kept somewhere and uh, i was like no I, you know i don't want to throw them i want to do something with it so i started making all these uh, patchwork jackets and you know we made these coasters and this is on the right is another way of how you know you can make a textile right uh, by using waste you can be so innovative i feel i feel there's a lot more to do so you know upcycling and sustainability uh upcycling up is always one of the stories in my collections I, every season i try to explore it in a new way and sustainability will always be a cornerstone i think people talk so much about sustainability these days this sustainable brand that sustainable brand i think it is it should be at the core we, at this point in time in the world we should not even be talking about sustainability it should be like a given um then yeah you know i i have a certain amount of fascination with the discarded or you know i do end up seeing beauty in very strange places you know sometimes i'm taking a walk and you know something is i mean i keep seeing compositions and uh, you know it could be nature it could be a lot of things uh, that sort of fascinate me and other people may just sort of not see any beauty in it at all right so you know, this story is another story that we worked with and it's eco dyeing and it is using the discarded petals uh marigold and rose petals from the temples so you know the fabric is of course uh, treated and then uh, your marigold gives a nice uh, olive color uh, you know on um, sort of pressing it together and uh, 
putting it through steam gives a nice dye uh, of uh, olive and the rose petal gives a nice uh, blue uh, sort of a thing so yeah i'll just play this short video which has glimpses of you know what the process is like From my spring summer 18, I think I have yet some uh, khadis left behind, and I said, you know, how are we going to redefine these? And that's where the whole concept of you know eco dyeing and petal dyeing sort of came into existence. That's where we started brainstorming about that. And uh, also, again, you know, whatever we sort of uh, you know use in the temples, the petals that are uh, the flowers. You know, they eventually go waste, right? They're discarded. So we started by collecting, you know, marigold and rose flowers, which are not too old because then they won't give out the pigment, and started utilizing them with, uh, you know, khadis and you know, sort of uh, treating it and you know, trying to get those impressions onto the khadi garment fabric, and then make a garment out of it. So that's how you know this one way of really utilizing your old fabric as well as introducing it. Hi guys, I think I'm running out of time, so I'm just gonna quickly go through the other things. So, um, you know, at the beginning only, I think 2018, uh, these are some of the recognition that the brand has got, and definitely, I think it's very uh, motivating for me also. So, we got a, a surface in the surface de uh, development category, I got the Grazia Young Fashion Achievers Award. Then the second was uh, Gen Next, which was uh, organized by uh, Reliance by Lakme Fashion Week. And it was a great mentorship program. It sort of launched the brand in, uh, you know, at the Fashion Week and, you know, it got all sorts of eyes and a lot of feedback, etc. So I think this was a great experience as well. Then the next was uh, we got the L Graduates Award. And uh, this was organized by L, the team at L. And uh, this was in ready to wear. I won under the ready to care, uh, wear category. And here we, I also got an opportunity to work with the Reliance Industries uh, upcycle fabric, which is uh, upcycled um, after uh, you know recycling uh, used bottles. And you know, and we designed the Earth T2. And this is. Uh, uh, we're, we're finalists currently for Scouting for India by Vogue Talents. And I would say some of my future plans, uh, if I were to talk about it, could be anywhere in the space of home. Uh, and yeah, you know, and I'm looking forward to maybe say some projects or some things to uh, pan out like that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yadvi, for taking us through your design journey, your ideology, the creation of your wonderful uh, brand, Yavi, and taking us through the myriad facets of what Yavi is attempting to do. It's just been fascinating. Thank you so much, both Yadvi and Tilini, for sharing your um, journeys with us today. I would like to now introduce and welcome our moderators for the conversation. Um, Disha Parikh is a young lifestyle and accessory designer who is unfortunately not able to join us um, uh, due to an emergency. Uh, we also have Anashwara Mandali, who is a graduate from RV College of Architecture, Bangalore, currently pursuing her master's in interior design at Pratt University, New York. Um, her interest lies in graphics, interior, and architectural design. Uh, it's a delight to welcome Anashwara to Design Conversation. With this, we request the audience to please share their questions for our speakers. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Um, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. And um, both your presentations were really, really insightful. Um, so my first question is to Delini. Uh, so in your work with the Jeffrey Bava Trust, what were some of the considerations that were important in order to harmonize with the timeless and vibrant architecture that Bava represents? Um, I think I mentioned that it was a terrifying task, but um, when I had to create uh, the designs and everything, I didn't try to reinvent the wheel because he was representative of a specific style that was evident in everything. Um, so it wasn't about uh, me as a graphic designer going in and like injecting my style. It was pretty much understanding the style that he represented 
I'm kind of extracting that and creating um, the program identity. Um, yeah, I, and I think in the presentation, I did show that the colors, uh, the text, everything we did use uh, what we had in front of us. Uh, we didn't try to make any extra graphics because like the framing of a picture of Bawa's work in self is just fine, like it's perfect. So yeah. Thank you. Um, that's really great to know uh, while dealing with sensitive architecture and really uh, design that's so uh, iconic. Um, so my next question is to Yavi. Uh, uh, what, what were some of the challenges that you faced while setting up your design practice? And has your design ideology evolved or changed because you work so intimately with craftsmen who are skilled in such traditional techniques? So, uh, you know, I think uh, the um, in terms of I evolving of ideology, I think ideology is the same. It will always remain the same. It it sort of defines and, you know, defines the philosophy, brand philosophy and all. And working with artisans was always something that was a part of it. So, you know, I didn't really have to, uh, you know, bringing that in, the tradition in, did not have to have a change or necessarily, you know, the evolving of the uh, thing. But of course, evolution in terms of what evolution now that has been happening is, has been in terms of, you know, what the market wants. It's more like a learning, you know, on the field. And yeah, there was another question, right? Yeah, and what were some of the challenges that you faced while setting up your own practice? So I think uh, definitely starting a new business in a market which is so competitive is a huge challenge on its own. It's a huge, huge, huge challenge. So yeah, I think uh, I think that is that has been the challenge to sort of, uh, you have to have a USP, you need to be original, you need to have a edge over the others. And, you know, that's how you get noticed because otherwise it's a saturated uh, sort of market. So I think that has been a challenge, but I think as long as people are sort of sticking to their originality, it should uh, guide their own path. Yes, that that's definitely something that all young designers are trying to, uh, who are trying to make their, you know, space in the field uh, have to keep in mind. So thank you for that. Um, so my next question is directed to Thilani. Uh, and could you speak more, a little bit more about your work with local and international rights-based organizations? Because I, I know you mentioned um, a little bit about how you're interested in advocacy work. Um, yeah, so when mm -hmm. um, I have 15 years of experience and I, for of that, like for 10 years, I worked for as in a professional capacity in like a full-time capacity to different organizations. And I think Yadvi also said that uh, something about the corporate sector or the corporate not being the cup of tea, which was the same for me. Um, every year it was like a process of elimination of my also understanding how I feel as a person, like my soul slowly draining, which I didn't want to do. So actually after the Vietnam, if I came back from Vietnam, what I did was reach out to uh, bright space organizations and especially like feminist organizations wanting to contribute to campaigns that they're doing um, and any kind of campaigning. And uh, that has been pretty successful. It's, it was just a matter of reaching out and also understanding where my um, values lie and reaching out to organizations that align with those values. Um, which is also the trust, right? The Jeffrey Bava Trust, I feel massively privileged to work for them because it's um, it kind of contributes my understanding and uh, my passion for the arts. Um, yeah, so in terms of your question, um, I have contributed to a bunch of campaigns um, and glo glo global and local organizations like uh, Global Freedom Front and Priya, which is based in, I think, India, but also global. And there's Women and Media Collective in Sri Lanka. So it's like a range of um, from mental health to specific rights about uh, domestic migrant rights. So it's been a range of campaigning that I've been involved with. Um, so yeah. 
Thank you. Um, yeah, it's really inspiring to see how design can make a positive change in the social sphere. Um, so yeah, my next question is directed to Yadvi, and this is kind of related to the question I asked you earlier. So uh, as a proprietor, how does your interaction with craftsmen change the uh, change actually change with craftsmen and how do you build a bridge between your design process and what they bring to the process of design? Okay, so you know, uh, the most important thing is to understand the ecosystem of the craftsman. You know, so the first and foremost thing when you work with a craftsman is you need to know what their processes are, what thoroughly at each and every stage, because then you understand them technically, you know, and then you can see within that particular sphere without changing that a lot, because, you know, then they are very apprehensive to try something new. You know, so to see where are the opportunities within that where you can bring in uh, design intervention. So then you work on just those bits and then everything sort of falls together. You know, you don't have to change what they're doing. We're supposed to be taking it ahead. Of course, seeing it with our eyes, there has to be newness to it. But it is never by destroying their ecosystem. It is always sort of coming together. Yeah. Uh I mean, that's very similar to how we deal with architecture as well, where we respond sensitively to the context and the ecosystems that exist. Um, so uh, to actually end this session, I am going to ask you ask a question that's for both of you. And Yadvi, I know you spoke to this a little bit earlier in your presentation. Um, so what are some of the key takeaways from design school that you still apply in your practice? and? Uh, I wanted to ask you if you had any advice for young designers who are trying to make their way and establish their own sense of identity in this world that's so saturated with designers from all over the world. Hi. So um, I feel that uh, I think, yes, at every stage, uh, you know, my design education has helped me define who I am. Like design, one of the things that we always said at NID was, you know, design is finding solutions to a problem. You don't create it because you're just feeling like creating something or it's something aesthetic. No, you need to solve a problem. You need to identify where there is a problem or a gap in the market or a space in the market for you. And then you need to work according to that. It should always be adding value to the consumer, right? So, yes, that is one thing. Then, like I said, you know, working with crafts and textiles has been a very important part. It was already, I think, a part of me and then got further ingrained at NIT. Yes. And those were the two things. And for young designers, like I said, I would the only thing I would say would be like relentlessly follow your dreams and be original because the whole world knows what's happening. So I think those are the two most uh, important parts and have faith in yourself. <laughs> yep. Thank you. Um, Tilini, do you have something to add to this conversation? Um, yeah, I think Yadvi really um, explained that really well. Um, I think for me, it was just through experience that I figured out what I really want to do or which sector that I really want to contribute to. And I think you have to trust the process as well, because uh, like I said before, the process of elimination really made me think about what I want to do. But I don't know how I would have been if I got through to the advocacy and the arts from the start, right? So it's important to always have a set of values and not compromise on that and keep working on it until, you know, it might take a while, but not to rush the process, but trust the timing and everything. That's really great advice. Thank you so much. Um, since we're running out of time, I, I would like to hand over the floor to Team DU to take it further. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Um, it's important to have interdisciplinary conversations to understand and appreciate varied perspectives to design and to also strengthen collaborations amongst designers, especially in our region. So um, thank you, Yadvi and Tilini, for sharing your wonderful work, personal journeys and projects and your extremely insightful presentations. We wish you both all success. Thanks to our moderator, Anishwara, for engaging our speakers in a thoughtful provoking dialogue to our audience, DU, VSLA, and Clayworks team. A special thank you to Grishma, a DU intern who completes her internship. We wish her all success. Have a good evening and see you on Saturday. I would like to invite Kavindu from the Design United uh, team to share the upcoming series of events and a little film about DU. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Thilini and Nadvi, for your wonderful presentations today. Uh, thanks to our moderators, Anishraya, for an interesting and thought-provoking conversation. Uh, we'd like to extend our gratitude to Clearworks for supporting this webinar and all of our future webinars. So far, Design United has successfully completed 33 installments of design conversations, and we've got many more exciting speakers lined up with designers across the spectrum joining us to share their thoughts. Uh, next week, we're joined by architect Chaitna, architect Kinera, and architect Radha, the founders of Studio Inscape, along with architect Santosh and architect Raja Krishnan in the design conversation. We're joined by many more great speakers in the up upcoming months, including artist JC Ratnayaka and many more. Uh, at the start of the new year, we're pleased to have architect Tanoj from Kerry Hill Architects for our in-progress session. Do also fill in a feedback form that will pop up on your browser about today's webinar. In a socially distanced world, Design United is an optimistic digital platform for collaborative design and connection. Design United was created in March 2020 during a period of intense lockdown and quarantine measures within the region. The aim behind Design United was to create an optimistic space for regional dialogue, connections, collaborations, and opportunities for young regional designers and design practices. A much needed network of support and peer mentorship during these uncertain times. Talented young designers and design studios working on design innovation with an approach that is relevant to our South Asian region have been invited to be a part of the platform. We also encourage design students from the region to share their work, be involved in the dialogue, and to be an active part of Design United. Design United, most of all, believes in creating a community of designers and design knowledge that is largely contextual with focus on contributing to the environment and our community. Design United believes greatly in a spirit of collaboration and idea exchange. Uh, join us and stay inspired. And so follow us on our social media for our upcoming conversations. Until next time, stay safe and take care. Thank you. Uh, I request uh, Thilini and Nadavi to stay back for a moment just to get some feedback on today's session uh, and some feedback in general about DU. Thank you. Um, I think uh, Thilini, you can go first. You can take a moment to like collect your thoughts and begin. Hey. Um... I, that is great. Uh, and the fact that you all gave me time, I think from September, which, which was amazing. Although I have to say, I only started working on it recently. Um, and the thing is, I've been asked to speak at things many times, but it's always short notice. But the fact that there was time to collect my thoughts and put the presentation together, even if it was recent, um, was really, really helpful. Um, the feedback and just general, um, just the general, 
sorry. Um, uh, generous, general correspondence with the team was great. Uh, yeah, and this is amazing. And I can't believe like y'all started it in March and it has grown so much and y'all have had so many conversations um, and definitely needed within like a regional perspective. And yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> Great, thank you so much for the feedback. Um, Delini, uh, I mean, Yadvi, would you like to say anything? Yeah, I think I would like to say again the same thing. You know, remember I was very uh, apprehensive of doing it very quickly and, you know, Varna allowed me as much time as I needed. And I think that was really nice. Uh, it really encouraged me to not uh, give up. And originally I was very apprehensive because I realized everybody is from an architecture background and, you know, most of the presenters are architects. And I'm like, what am I going to do? But no, I don't know. I was very apprehensive about it. But, you know, how Varna sort of... Um, you know, put it to me, like, you know, talk about your design process. And she really encouraged me to talk about it. So, yeah, I thought that was really, really nice. And I myself had a lot of fun sort of, you know, going back in the journey and, you know, now looking at the dots connecting, you know, you always look at your life like that. And I think it's 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 been fun. It's been a lot of fun. Yes. And I, I also went through some of the other talks and I think they were very interesting Yeah, before I uh, made my own presentation. So I really enjoyed that too. Thank you so much, Yadvi. I think this was a really fun uh, session with visual design from Tilani and fashion design from you. I think it's the first time we're having a fashion designer on our platform. Mm -hmm. So um, you're like the pioneer and we hope to have many more such conversations also. Oh, and, so um, yeah, and we hope that you stay in touch with you because at its essence, this is about connections. So Absolutely. hope to you and speak to you soon again. This was a lovely conversation. Um, so I think we're going to conclude now. Um, thank you so much again from behalf on behalf of the entire team, and um, speak to you soon. Thanks. Thank, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you guys.